Hi, my name is Benedict. I decided I'm going to do another series. Uh, for quite some time now, I've been avoiding drums deliberately. I've seen them as not really my purview. Uh, also, in part because I handled drums ten years ago when I started writing uh, writing blogs. Uh, but perhaps it's time to, to break that apart because I think that. Um, from what I see, there are a lot of people who are not really fully understanding drums and therefore, because they're making very drum heavy mixes, they're struggling because they're essentially using the wrong type of sounds and not getting as in control of the sounds as they can be. Now being me, this is going to be a lot about the thinking of drums. Uh, I'll take each major sound per video and, and break down the components that make up that kind of sound. Now that means that if you only ever make samples, which personally I see as, a, as, a, as, a, as an awful failing, um, take me as seriously or as humorously as you want on that one, uh, if you're only using samples, at least by understanding the components that I'm showing here, it's more likely to be able to hear them in the samples that you're using. Or if you get into a mix of making and using samples, you know what you need to add or perhaps subtract. It's always easier to add than subtract. So we will use the almighty Kong drum designer. Now I know most of you would immediately go, oh look, this device is made for making bass drums. It ain't gonna happen, at least not right away. Because remember, I wanna break this down into the separate components and what we wanna do. So we'll start with our tone control. Ooh, that's a funny sound and thing for a drum. First thing we're gonna do is probably drop that pitch. Sometimes that's a problem. Sometimes we do that too far. The other things we've got here is we've got this shape control. You can hear it easier high up. So if we increase our decay. So obviously that's changing our wave. So for your classic 808 type kick drum sound, you don't really want any overtones in there. In other words, you can turn that shape right down. And yes, commonly we want to turn our pitch right down. This is the regular thing that you hear, that great big long 808. Now that's great. To create bass that you can hear, you need time. And I know that's a challenge for a lot of you, because you try and put in a lot of bassy sounds really fast. But remember, bassy sounds need time. So you can hear how bassy this is. Boom. Ooh, the meters are really loving that. Boom. Nice and bassy. But let's pull this right back so it's really short. Doesn't seem bassy at all. We don't have the time to hear the bass develop. And the more we have an attack on it, the less bassy it seems. So, bassiness needs time. And also notice how this seems a lot quieter now than when we let it speak out. If we look at those meters, the, the volume difference isn't really a lot. They're essentially the same. So, that proves to get bassiness you need time, which is right. Traditionally, your hip hop mixes were relatively sparse on the top end, and they left a lot of space for those kicks and subs to work in. So, if you try to do something like a death metal mix and work in a lot of bass, you're really going to struggle with that quite tremendously because it's such a fast style. And I do comment on a lot, but that's part of why Lars pulled out the bass in justice to allow that kick to start to come through. So we will start with our sound. Now, kick drums don't all have to be super low. There's nothing wrong with pitching a kick. Here, there are still plenty of things that you can do with that. 
one of the big things with the kick is this, the, the bend. So if we're working with a normal synthesizer, we'd have an ADSR envelope wired up to the pitch. We'd be sending the pitch high at the beginning of the note, fading off as the note goes through. That's all this is doing. We can set how long that decay takes. Our kick will tend to be clickier the faster the attack. Now these are very fast envelopes. Compared to synth, very fast. Absolutely nothing wrong with, and this is your uh, mini called mini pops type sound of having just a tone. Thing is though, if you let it be long, it essentially becomes a bass sound, in which case you want to tune it probably to the fundamental of your piece. If it's short, it's just a little thump, and that has charm. If it's got lots of attack, it'll pop which will help pull it through the mix, but you'll lose some of the feeling of that oomph that you're looking for, because that's that little And depending on how you go with attack, it's always that balance thereof. As soon as we put on a little bit of attack, This is that classic craft quirky zap sound, which normally will be higher, but commonly hear it low as well. The 909 type sound is about having a fairly big bend, so that's your envelope amount, and a fairly slow attack. So it what you're hearing is you're actually catching it in the middle of that ramp and that gives you that <laughs> that you get in a 909 sound rather than the um, uh, 808 sound which is more this sort of thing same essential generator that's just a slower attack but a larger If we start to add shape, it's basically turning it square wavy, you start to get that overdriven sound, which is essentially just adding more tops to it. So the first thing that we tend to think of when we think of kick drums is lots of welly. Big Wellington boots kicking us in the rear. And while that can be a very important part of the mix and how we handle kick drums, bass drums, it can also become a real liability because to get that bass, remember it needs to be long. So if you're working pretty fast, the fastest being that classic death metal egg beater type thing, the double kick drums, and you're producing a lot of bass, therefore time, it's okay once in a while with that sort of sound but it's not going to work in a complex mix. So you have to pull it back. And that's when we start to have to compromise. And drums are always about compromise. Mixing is always about compromising as well. So in the headphones, that sounds like a pretty reasonable start to a mix for a, for a drum. Obviously, it's not in reference to anything. So we'll look at different types of how we can put together drums including, even though I won't use any, including the basics of acoustic drums as well. But that's a pretty classic drum machine type sound. We can raise its pitch a little bit, tune it. That'll also help give it a little bit more cut through the mix. Work in your mix on that, not in solo. 
is a situation where I'm working in solo, so nothing much has much reference to anything, but I am using 30 years of mixing to add to this as well. So we've got a kick sound. Now we need to pull this through the mix. There are essentially two ways that we can do that. First one we'll look at is with noise. This noise generator has a little click generator as well. I don't love that. I invariably turn that off. It's also set to have a, a sweep of the pitch. Also don't love it. We're not trying to make a snare drum here. So we've now got to handle what we do here. And now the smartest way to handle this is to get that right on the front. So see how this attack is a little slow. This attack super fast and the decay is super fast as well. So we're just making this little tick 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 sound, which actually comes in before this kick has fully developed, before the tone has developed. Commonly you're not going to want it as loud as that, so you pull it down to that point where you're not saying, oh that's my sound. It's sitting in the mix. You can change your tone. Really busy mix, you can go really surprisingly high. Now with in the drum machine days, it was very, very common. If you listen to classic 80s stuff, not Night Rider crap or Retrowave, but listen to real classic stuff from uh, 79, 80, and listen to drum machines, and you'll commonly hear that the kick drum, which is pretty small sound, has a hi hat layered on it. The two commonly play together. So that hat pulls the kick through, and that's part of why you think instinctively what a cool mix cutting sound that is, because they've welded this sound, this tick tick tick, into the sound. You can even do that kind of thing by making drum machine I had type sounds. So this part here, yes you can make these separately and we can get to the end and have a sound that we love so much we can sample it off. But you've cast something in concrete without a mix. So I'll commonly say okay I know I'm going to want one of these in my mix but I don't really know where I want it to be. If, I make, if I'm starting my drums with a sound in my head of what I want them to be then yes, I'll, I'll say, okay, well, this is where I want this to be. I might say, yeah, that's, that's cool. I might say that's what I want. But this will get adjusted. This bit, more than anything else, will get adjusted when we go into the mix. I will adjust this, the tunings and all of that in the mix. It's because it's got to work in the mix. Remember, the mix isn't hung around the drums. The drums are hung around the mix. The drums are hung around the music. I know that's anathema to both to most of you because you think it's the complete other way around that you put in some storming drums and then and you, you, you throw a couple of bits of random synthesizer shit on top and go, yeah, righteous. But you don't make great tracks that way. It just isn't done that way. No matter what you read in magazines or see on tutorials, it's not the way it's really done. Guys might be writing it that way, but by the time you get to be Liam of the Prodigy, you've got 20, 30 years experience behind you. So you can work seemingly backwards because you know what your end game is. So take care. Write your music first, add your drums. You can use placeholder drums in the beginning, but you really work on your drums when you've got a mix. So. I'll adjust this as I get my mix happening, and I'll also adjust this a lot. The whole aim of this is to pull it through the mix. Cool. Next thing that we can do to pull through the mix, we can actually use another tone. The tone here. Let's extend that a little bit. Let's add a tone. Sounds horrible, but it's not meant to work that way. Again, we probably want to keep this short. 
Ooh, now we're starting to have a little bit of a little bit of cut here. No doubt you've heard this sound before. So you're using a little kind of sound on top, exactly the same as we did with the um, with the noise sound to help pull that through. And you will hear that quite a lot. So when you listen to, to tracks and you think, what? what interesting sounding kick drum they've done that now we can also bring in more layers don't have enough layers automatically here so i'll bring in another one we can bind the two obviously far too much See, so we've got three layers now. That allows our kick to actually be operating a fair way through the mix. When we've got only this, only this guy, it's operating right here underneath the mix. And that's in many ways great. When you mix it right, that's the nicest and the easiest way to do it. However, because we all want bigger sounds, this has now got it operating twice in the mix. You tune this either to purely poke a hole through the mix, so where there's naturally a little bit of a hole in the mix, you tune that. This one here gets tuned to that, just to poke that little hole in the mix. And then you'll hear it and your brain will attach it to the other sand and pull it through. Or, of course, you can make the whole sand bigger by adding a little bit of noise so it's spread across the whole range now. There's a little bit of something that's kick drum the whole way through. A very good way to be able to pull your sand through where you want it to. There's another trick that we can use here as well. We will send this through the bus effects first. So at the moment, our whole sound is going, just for people who aren't big on reason, uh, we're taking these two sounds and we're putting them into the bus effects. So it's not being used as a send effect. The sound's going to here, which means it's going to go to here. Our friend, the EQ. Now, I know what most of you are going to do when you get an EQ. You're going to go, ooh, kick drum. Now that sounds pretty mighty. Don't get me wrong, I understand that's pretty mighty. But we're going to end up with some problems with that down the track. So, in many ways, you are better off narrowing this right down. You can, if you want to, operate on frequencies down here, but you might be better off pulling up here. See yeah, how it's still a bassy sound? But you've given it that click that makes it a fast sound, but you can still let your bassiness come through. So we could actually turn off other parts of the sound. hard when we don't have much in the way of overtones. We added our shape, but I don't like that sound. I really don't like it. Hear how that's giving us 
a little bit of the same sort of effect as having this tone in. So you can run one or many of these things at once to choose where you layer the parts of your kick drum to let them work in the mix later. And you can choose any parts of this. You can choose to get to, to work just on the bass. So we can do things like grabbing our equalizatorium device. Again, attempting to do this, but you've also created mud under here. So it's not always the wisest thing to be doing. Better off working with these guys. Similar, but less here. Now I know we can get in and do this. But why solve a problem when you can avoid creating it in the first place? Consider that. Don't create a problem if you don't need to. So we can create oomph there. We've got absolutely everything happening in this mix now. Pretty mighty drum. Notice there's no compression happening here at all. Not a single bit. Well, we can add compression in one of a couple of places. We'll start by adding it here. You go too short and you attack and release we start to add distortion. Makes the sound, sound cool when it's soloed, but make notice it also makes the sound longer. Because what we've done is we've added, rather than the, the tick just being on the front of the sound, and it trails off, we've now got effectively noise running the whole way through the sample, or the sound, if that's what you're after. Brilliant, you're doing a great job, but be careful. So notice here, the longer the release, the more we're just emphasizing the bit on the front. I turn up my volume here, the compressor is turning it down as on the peak at the beginning and then allowing the, the volume to be up high. So it's only controlling the very peak, which is essentially making the sound seem larger, longer. Not necessarily what we're after, because we're really after cut. We can do that. But if you're after cut, that ability to that tick, which really pulls through the mix, do it that way. There's no need to over compress. Sounds great on its own, but the whoop part of it is coming after the attack, which means that the sound needs more space to operate in. You've got an open mix, by all means. But here, we've got the attack, the tick, and we're turning the volume down as it's starting to oomph, which means that we kind of hear it more in the front end. So that's compressing. And you're probably going to think, oh, it sounds worse with the compression on, but no, we're about letting that have punch to push through the mix. And then we can.
can add our EQ afterwards. Or we can have a pretty extreme EQ here and then add a compressinator after it. Different sound, because what this does is it takes everything we've done so far and jams it together. So this has jammed everything together before we've then said, oh, I'm going to EQ. Now we're going to EQ and jam it all together. Here again, how we've kind of gone straight to Let's look for it's really nice. It's really, really sharp now. So we need that to cut through the mix. Death metal mix, whatever. Excuse me, whilst I put my camera back where it belongs. That's actually going to work really, really nicely. We might look to tighten up this because there's a lot of load that's happening there that doesn't serve a purpose when we're moving fast. That's kind of cool. Now we might not want to be attacking it that hard. So we've taken this full sound with all those parts. Now we're tightening it up. Entirely up to you which way you go. Little flabby, great sound on solo, a little flabby. Still got most of the most of what's going on in there, but we can tighten it up. Quite a versatile sound. You can run many layers of compression if you like. But understand, after a little while, if you're compressing on top of compressing, you're getting some pretty extreme results. Maybe you'd be better off doing that in the first place, but sometimes you just get different results from that. Uh, Eight-year-old got her ears pierced. Good news, apparently no death for crying, so that's good. So lots of layers of sand there. We've got a pretty complex sand, which we wouldn't necessarily recognize as being Groceries, a drum machine sound. So if you're really getting fussy about creating drum sounds that are going to work perfectly in your mix, do take the time. Rather than just saying, oh, I'm going to randomly throw some drum samples together and hope that I get something great, you can do that. But why not say, OK, I'm going to pull it apart and I know that my kick drum has a tone. That's its basic sound. So if you get um, a piece of cloth, say like a bed sheet, and, and pull it a little bit tight, and then boop, 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 you'll start to hear that tone. That's the skin on the kick drum. So when you're kicking it with the beta, you're actually hearing that skin, and that's your main tone there. You can add in your beta, which is this fella here, that little little bit of noise, 
In the 80s, they would actually stick credit cards to where the beta hits to get more of a, a click on the front there, which is this thing you need to pull through the mix. And then you can look at adding in other tones. Think of them as overtones, and they will tend to be the shell. Some drum shells, the round bit, are built to be relatively dead inert. So they're just translating and, and amplifying the skin that's being hit. Some of them are actually designed to create their own resonance. So the, old, the older uh, wooden kits, so Ludwigs and things like that, often called jazz kits, little drums often. And the wood would naturally give some vibration as well. So you end up with a with a more complex tone. More complex tone, great in some situations, total screaming liability in others, to, but all comes down to your mix. But here, all those elements, we can then look at generally adding. So we say, okay, I want to add a little bit more poke. So we'll add this. I want to add a little bit more contour to the, to the ADSR of the sound, so I might add a little bit of compression. We can change the tone of our sound. Generally try not to pick out more than two bits that you're going to highlight, and you generally need to highlight those two bits quite a fair way from each other. If I were to do this, just doesn't sound as good. It's hard to make it work. But that's not dissimilar from having a wooden shell around your sound. Obviously a little bit more complex than that. I mean we could get into to multiple boosts through here. Like we could say okay that's going to be 60 hertz, that's going to be 120 hertz, and there's going to be another one at 240. So we're actually creating our, our own overtone series there, which you can then say, okay, that's part of the, the wood of my sound. By all means do them, but if you're worried about losing clarity, it's mostly what we're after, is this pure skin tone. If you're worried about losing that sense of clarity, then perhaps break them out. So you create parallel channels. So you say, okay, this first channel, I'm gonna work on my skin. The second parallel, I'm going to work on adding an overtone or two. And then maybe a third parallel, I'm gonna add a top tone cut tone and then you can put them back together and you're probably going to want to compress them in that bus just so that they glue together because if you've got a lot of very separate work like you've pulled each part out separately then you probably need to gel them together again otherwise they may sound kind of like oh you've got this here and you've got that there and how do they belong together possible this sounds a little like that once we get it in a mix just because of the cans and the fact that I've got no mix around it. There's an awful lot more you can get into with, with drums, but just remember whenever you're looking at your drums and looking at getting them through your mix, look at these components. Your skin tone, like your core fundamental tone, any overtones that you want to add. Each overtone that you add adds complexity. The simplest one to add being a little bit of noise. Pitched somewhere to be the beta sound to pull that through your mix. Then EQ. Watch out for the automatically saying I'm going to add every bit of bottom end that I can. It's, it's commonly like a, a pretty unwise strategy to take. 
focus on giving yourself cut. It's more important to have cut than it is to have welly. Lots of welly, sounds impressive when you're soloed, screw later. If you don't want to believe me, go back to the last video, which was called Overmix, and there you actually watch me struggle with a mix that I've deliberately built over loud. And that's from starting with overly loud drum sounds, adding another overly large bass, and you can then AB the mixes between the over loud one, which on the surface sounds great, but you end up not really being able to hear any of what the piece is about, to me pulling back, preparing the mix properly. You've still got nice, very present drums, but you can actually hear all the musical lines as well. So there, there are your parts. Do this. If you're going to make samples, great. But understand a sample's printed, and that's it. You can't change it. If at all possible, leave this kind of live like this. And then as you're working through your piece, you're going, OK, in my mix, no, that's kind of the wrong place. I'll put that there. Or no, I want to give it a bit of a tone. I'll put it there. With a sample, you can't change that. Once it's there, it's baked in. You can get clever and try and go, oh, well, I've got that. Oh, I, bet I need to kind of find that and notch it out. But it's not the same here. I can't really get rid of it because it's already baked in. So focus on starting with sounds that serve their purpose, add extra parts to that. And the way that you add is by consciously adding overtones. So we can add overtones to a very simple sound, like a sound that has no no overtones in the first place, which is our sine wave kick, by quite literally adding in another tone. Do that. Let's get rid of the See how that adds. Let's say this was a wooden box, then decay is going to be low. For a you know, like a little classic Ludwig set or something like that, we've now got that complex type sound. I'm not saying it sounds like a Ludwig, but we've got some of that feel. You can add a little bit of beta on top of that, but not too much. some of our excessive EQ and compression. We've got some of that happening. There are various things you can do. You can even pull in other devices, like, and I showed this in the overload, this, just so you can hear it. We'll pull that out. Overdrive is a world in itself in drums, and I relatively opposed to using it uh, until you want it to sound driven. A little bit of saturation on this end of the sound, by all means. But as soon as you start hearing it as distortion, unless we're talking happy hardcore or something, I don't think it's a wise idea. Another way of emulating overtones. So we're using a resonator. A tiny bit of drive may be okay, but I can't hear it well enough in these, these headphones. I don't think this is the knob for that. You've got other devices you can use, maybe a screen or something like that. But 
we can add a little bit of overtone with a resonator. You can now hear how it's starting to sound like a tub. Is that a better sound for a techno mix? Oh god no. It's a flubby tubby. We can pull our attack right down. All very subtle. I run through that just to show you how much range. Still, uh, still a kick drum. Another way to add an overtone or add subtlety. Now with drums, it is subtlety. It has to be subtle. That's part of why I don't like um, the big overdrive knob because you lost all subtlety. There are ways to create other kinds of subtlety, and if you want to want to get into them, then start listening to Skinny Puppy Records. They 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 found a bazillion ways to overdrive drums. Another method is is this fella, but this is a bit more limited in what you can do with it. So we can ring modulate and put the two together. adding that little extra sound. A million ways to do this. One of the problems with using the ring modulator is that you can then really only control the length of this unless you've got a, an envelope to control mix or something you can really only control the envelope by controlling the K sound of the original tone. So it, it can walk you into some corners if you're not careful, but we start to get a cool sound. We had a second tone to start with, so we will let that be a Okay, so once I've got my sound the way I like it, I'm assuming that's the sound I'm happy with. Hold this up. No need to add stuff in the way when you're not looking at it. We can then look at what we do. We'll quickly look at this. Obviously, this changes the way our sound behaves 
quite dramatically. And that's all going to depend on the, uh, the kind of drive that you use. Tubes are all about adding sparkle on the top. So don't assume you're going to add more bass with a tube. They're a great way of pulling things through, as you hear. This is really upped to travel. You can then get into all kinds of, of ugly kinds of things to do to sounds, play with them yourself, but focus on your pulling things through the mix. The next thing is largely reverb. Cool, sounds like a basketball court. Useful in a mix? Probably not. I struggle to get useful kick drum sounds with balls. Entirely up to you which way you go. Look at how much pre-delay you're using. If I'm putting a fair bit of effect on a drum, I'll tend not to use much. Otherwise you start to get this effect. And look at different shaped rooms, all comes down to what your reverb does. But the trick is very dry. Just looking to add a bit. That's where the small space is here. Can be really useful. Tempting to say we roll off all the high frequencies. Depends what you want to do, but that can see you putting a lot of tub onto your sound as you go, oh, I'm hearing a lot of reverb. Here yeah, we're putting a lot in the low end, not so much in the high end. You can solve that in part by turning your EQ on and then just rolling off. This is from about 128 hertz, we're just rolling that. So you can use that to, to control bass and treble and what have you. You can also choose to choose what you want to pull through. So you might say, yeah, I want to pull that through. So that's helped pull through. The high end part of that made it a slightly longer sound, which will actually help that cut through the mix without making the rest of the sound troublesome. Because we've got a lot of clicky on this, kind of a more of a rock type sound. So you can you can bake in your, your reverbs. You can do things like taking your reverb, putting a compressor after it. More powerful when you get a longer reverb. So if we went back to a room, way of tightening that back up really comes down to, to personal preference and what you're trying to achieve. 
that's probably the second way I would try it. The first way is that reverb's generally about trying to create a space and have it sound natural. So you generally don't want to go processing your reverb, which can also do things like this. And then EQ after your reverb. All comes down to what you're trying to achieve. There is no particular rule there, but always ask yourself, what am I adding? And if you flip things from one place to another, like you see me just dragging things around, shift drag in, in reason, then rather than just going, oh, that sounds better, take the few moments to think to yourself, why does this sound better? What's this adding to the sound? As opposed to what's it doing over there? So if it's here, we've got our compressed and, e and, and um, reverberated sound, and then we're EQing it which means we've tightened up our sound with our compressor, we've added in the reverb, which is a kind of a lively sound, so we've lively did it back up again, and then we've added in the EQ afterwards, which makes the sound even more lively. If we put this here, any EQ type processing that we're doing inside our reverb, is processing this EQ as opposed to being creating the sound here and then being processed by this EQ. It will sound different. Subtle, sometimes not worth the effort, but it will sound different. If we put this before our compressor, then it means we're saying this is our core sound, now I'm squashing you. So the compressor will be responding to these EQ peaks back here it's responding to the raw sound, then adding these EQ afterwards. So you get subtle difference, but try and understand why you do that, why you try that, and what it does. Because every time you understand what it's done, that goes into your spreadsheet. Down the track, you can be sort of listening to a mix and sort of going, okay, I know this song's telling me it needs something, but I remember that. If you do this, this, and this, it's going to be what I need here. And it's that practice, consciously, that's going to help you. So, a bit more than you might have thought, as is typical with me. But remember, your drum is built of a skin, which is your core tone. Various ways to create overtones, including using noise. Noise is an overtone, it's just a whole pile of them. You can EQ to pull out particular frequencies. That's just creating overtones. And again, I will encourage you to focus more on bringing out overtones than your fundamental tone. Take your fundamental tone as a given. There are times you pull it out. Compression. Don't look at compression until you've got the core of your sound. Compression is about changing your ADSR changing how that envelope shape works over time. Use it then to enhance what you've got, not to create. So you're adding something with your compression, not trying to get rid of things. You can use multiple layers of compression, if you like, but would it be just as efficient to use one layer? You have to see what sounds right, but don't just say, oh, I'm going to add 57 layers of compression because I don't know what I'm doing. Because the key to that statement is, I don't know what I'm doing. And you know what happens when we don't know what we're doing? We go arse over. We don't want that. All this is about learning not to do that. Then you, your EQing is, again, bringing out certain elements. There are times where you may choose to make certain elements go away, but try not to put them in there in the first place. If we said... Oh, okay, I'm going to add all this here, and then said, oh, geez, I don't really want that. So we've got this. And then went around trying to get rid of it. Yeah, how it's really not going away. So be cautious about what you add 
and that then gives you the, the ability to add the elements that you want and if you choose the, the devices that you use carefully you can choose how much of the element that you want. Build your drums that way, particularly work on this finesse as you get in a mix. So that way you're listening to all the other elements that are there, which are the important elements, you know, the musical elements, the story elements, and then you're building these around them. So you're not doing something essentially dumb, like saying, okay, I'm going to put an overtone at 320 hertz, which just so happens to be the fundamental of your acoustic guitar that you don't want to roll off. But, so, everything that you add, if you can add it sparingly in little parts, you can adjust it when it comes to the mix, and you can have very detailed, very careful, really built-in gelled sounds, which will sound tremendous in your mix. Next video, I'll have a look at snares. Thank you.